All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. Somebody tell me, what in your, just tell me in your own words, is not, nobody's wrong here, just tell me in your own words, what is faith? Belief. Belief, okay. Faith, belief. Unseen. Unseen. Unseen belief. Okay. Actually, that's, that's two key words, two uh, uh, key adjectives describing this thing called faith. A belief in something and a belief in something you can't see with your eyes, right? Wouldn't it be nice? How many times do you think the word faith appears throughout the whole Bible? I'll bet a lot. I mean, I've never did a count on it. And I wish, you know, if I was sitting here behind my computer and brought up my software, I could count. How, much, how many times is faith? Google. Or you could, yeah, you could probably find that out through that. And I don't have an answer for you, but I do have a definition. And the definition didn't come from Strong's or Young or a Concordance, a Lexicon. The definition is right here in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is... faith is not some intangible or uncomprehendable uh, concept. Faith is defined as a, literally, a substance. This, this pulpit is made out of wood, right? You see the pulpit, but what is the substance? The substance is the wood, right? The pulpit itself, before somebody took the wood and, you know, drilled holes and put it all together and glued it, if there was any glue on there, probably glue right here. Before they built it, there was a, they had a picture of what they were building, right? It doesn't have to be exact, even it could have been rudimentary. That picture inside their mind, you could think of it like this. If it's something simple like this, you can just have a picture in your head. What if you're going to, if you're going to build a three-story home, you shouldn't just have it in the head, <laughs> right? They put it, they have a, a blueprint of the, of the house. I don't know if blueprint is the right word in a house, but an architect, sometimes the architect will design this, right? And everything is measured, I mean, it's measured out by the architect on paper, the plans. If the substance is the house itself, then the plan, the blueprint for the house, that would be the faith. Right? Or not to faith. No, the, the faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you're hoping, I said that wrong because you're hoping for the house. You have an image of what it is. You got the plan. You're hoping for the house. And then substance is added to bring it into this world, right? Well, that's really a key. As God is telling us, what he tells us about having faith, having faith, having faith, having faith. I personally believe that there's a, a little bit of difference between believing and having faith. 245 times the word faith appears. So it's good to know that in chapter 11 here we have the definition, right? Now, have you all ever been unemployed? Like you lost your job? Well, I'd really lose it. Somebody else is there doing it now. Okay, somebody stole your job. <laughs> you better kill your job, man. Yeah, right. Because I didn't wash it and wax it. <laughs> so, I can't relate to what you went through, but I can relate to what, what I went through. And when I had a job, I knew I had a job. I got up every day and went to the job, right? I knew I was getting paid, 
because I was working. But when they let me go, probably the first week, I was happy. (laughs) Because I never get the time off like that, you know. And then the next week, you're like, I think you have to wait. You, You don't get the unemployment until two weeks, you know. So you get to collect. In this country, you get to collect unemployment for six months, right? But after you get your first unemployment check, your dreams kind of fizzle out because you, you're used to making this much money and you see, you see the unemployment check, oh, wow. you know. And, and, and your unemployment check, I mean, if you've got a mortgage, if you've got an electric bill, you know, <laughs> that ain't going to cut it. I know uh, yeah. the one time I, when I was a contractor, I had been, everybody told me, you got to save up for retirement. got to save up. So I had a 401, and, and I just finally got 10, I had $10,000 in there. And I got let go. And the only source, the only thing I could turn to was my 401. So I took the money out of the 401, which got me through the time. And they gave me a 10% penalty, uh, tax me on it, they tax you on the money, and then they penalize me for, for taking it out to feed my kids because it was early withdrawal. When I was unemployed the third time, I realized that this money is not enough. So now I want to go back to work, right? But I can't just get up in the morning and go to work. First of all, where I worked, you needed a little security badge. <laughs> They wouldn't let me in there, right? The security's been revoked. Besides that, if I was able to get in, they'd say, what are you doing here? You don't work here anymore, right? In fact, I've discovered that me being let go put me in a position where I can't do anything about it. But I need a job, and so I'm hoping I'm going to get a job. So I come to church, and somebody says, well, you know, how's it going? I said, well, I'm, I hope I'm going to get that job. Well, what job are you hoping for? Huh? I have no idea. Any job, any job, right? Well, you get to the point right. where you'll do anything. Now, if you have options, then you can be a little choosy. But you don't have any control over it, right? So I'm hoping, I, I, I come back the next week, I say, I hope I have a job. I'm hoping that job will be here soon. So we all, let, let's go ahead and pray about it. I come up to the front. Everybody puts their hands on me, right? Father, you said, in the name of Jesus, you said that, that if we ask anything, you will do it. If we don't doubt it. So I walk out of that church, and I come back the next week, and somebody said, you have a job? And I say, I hope so. Wait a minute. Hope is not faith. Right? Hope is the plan. Hope is the pi- The picture in my mind is going to work right. and getting paid. Right. Right. But it has no substance. Right? So I come back to church and, and we're all pray for me again. And this time... You know, if somebody starts dancing a little jig, you know, somebody else starts moving in a special way. And all of a sudden, I, I'm like, I can feel it. I can feel it, right? And people say, did you get it? And he said, I sure did. I feel it. But you know what? Feeling is not faith. You can be misled by your feelings. You can think something's right. I have, uh, I can show you a billion people out there called Muslims that think they're right. Mormons think they're right. Jehovah Witnesses think they're right. Catholics think they're right. They worship a statue. They worship Mary, but they think they're right. And they feel it. They pray. I think I shared with you, one time I, I, I got down, I just I couldn't understand the mystique, and I got down behind, uh, on my knees before Mary, and I looked into her eyes. And all of a sudden, I could feel, I could feel something, and it was starting to terrify me. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
But fee, your feelings could be wrong because the, the feeling I had is get out of there. This is demonic. Somebody else would go, I can feel her. She's alive. She's alive. Right? So this brings in when, like what John said to describe faith. He said, belief. Believe something or faith, right? But I would say that how many people in this world of 7 billion people, how many of those people have the, pot- have the uh, ability to believe in something? Everybody has. Everybody believes in something. Right? I mean, yeah, exactly. When you're young, you, you learn to crawl and walk. And when, once you walk, you believe you can walk. You know, that kid gives up crawling and now he's walking all over, getting into everything, right? <laughs> right. Everybody can believe, but everybody can't have faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? And the hope is the blueprint. And the, in context, what, what, with this Bible, the 294 times it was that faith is in, was it? 245 in the New Testament. We don't care about the Old Testament right now. There's only two times in the Old Testament. That's in, that is interesting. I wonder if there's a different word, though, that sometimes the, the word is different. It probably might show up different. But, uh, yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting here. But 245 times they're talking about faith. But it's not talking about the faith that the Catholics have or the faith that the Muslims have. Faith in the Catholic system is not faith. It's belief. Right? Faith in Muhammad is not, or faith in Allah. It's not faith. It's what you believe. You can believe in, in Vishnu. Uh, Indian gods. They have, they got hundreds of thousands of gods. Some works in alligators. Yeah. Faith. To have faith, you have to have the word that God spoke. And God spoke words to you, and those words present a blueprint. This is why you should pray the word. When you want something, when when you want something according to, uh, one of the scriptures says, if uh, if we pray according to your will, he hears us, and if he hears us, we know we have what we asked for. But it's got to be according to his will. How are you going to know? You got the word. So, biblical faith, the difference between what the, the, what Christians have when they believe in what God said and what everybody else in the world has is they believe something, but we have faith. And now when we go back to the, the definition, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. Faith is the substance of the hope of the fulfillment of the word. And it's also the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Uh, put your, keep your finger there and go to 2 Corinthians. I know you've all heard this before. But just to bring it to your remembrance. Chapter 5. Verse 7. Somebody read that for me. Second Corinthians. Say it again. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, now somebody else read it. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Say it again. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, somebody else read it. <laughs> Say it again. Let's all do it together. For we walk by faith, not by sight. There's a smiley in here, too. There's a smiley in there? <laughs> There's a sideways smiley right here. There is? <laughs> okay. Oh, you're right. you're right. I got a little smiley there, too. 
But you notice that's in parentheses because that he, when Paul wrote this letter, all of a sudden this scripture, you know, he brought this this scripture in context with everything else. He, he's talking about we, um, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. He put that in there as kind of a sub-note or to, fo- or to complete what he was saying. But that scripture is extremely important in understanding faith. Because when we walk by faith, it's not by sight, right? Now, faith, as opposed to sight, when it said, when the Bible says compares faith to sight, remember we just got we just got few read, reading here. Faith is the substance of things over the evidence of things not seen, right? The evidence of things not seen. When we read, uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. And then it talks about the evidence of things not seen. So, you see with your eyes, right? But faith is the evidence of things not seen. When it says sight, I believe it's talking about the whole area of the physical body. We have five senses, right? I believe when it says, so we walk by faith, not by sight, it also means we walk by faith, not by hearing. We walk by faith, not by tasting. We walk by faith, not by smelling. In fact, anything having to do with your body is not faith. Right? I mean, you can, you can come up here, you can pray. But all that movement, all, even the praying, you're doing that in the body. But the true, the true faith is coming out of the spirit. The body counts for nothing. Right? So... This is really a principle we need to get over because, or understand, because when we say that uh, another religious belief, they believe something. But that's not with their spirit. I know it's not with their spirit. It's with their head, with their mind. They're believing with their mind. When a Christian believes the word, he's not believing with his mind. He's believing with the spirit man inside him. And I know those people aren't because the day Adam sinned, death came on him. But yet he still walked around for almost a thousand years. Right? God said, in the day you eat it, you will die. Something died. The moment, as soon as he partook, something died and it was the spirit man. Why did God give us the spirit? Our, the spirit man is the only means we have to communicate to God, with God. And you can have this book from Genesis through Revelation, but if you don't have the spirit of God, you can't understand this. That's why you have so many people out there. You've got professors out there that that know the Bible back and forth, teach the Bible, and what they teach is it's not true. They they don't they don't you got you got people that say they believe it, but they don't believe Jesus is God, or Jesus Jesus was uh, did miracles, or he was born of a virgin. They don't believe he's coming back again. We, we found this in our Revelation class. It talks, <clears throat> Revelation talks about the millennium, right? A thousand year millennium. But there's churches throughout the land, all churches throughout the world that do not believe there will be a millennium. Yet it says so. We read it. There's people in the church that do not know that there's a heavenly city that's going to come down to the earth called New Jerusalem. It's in their Bible. Why don't they know? They may have read it. <laughs> But they they say, well, that's a symbol of something else. That represents heaven. No, that represents exactly what it said. There's a city 
called the New Jerusalem. And in, on the new earth, it comes down and rests upon the new earth. And that'll happen, literally happen. Going back to my uh, job search. So I come back to church. I don't have the job, I, or I hope I had the job. When you left here last time, you said you felt it, you felt it. Right? But the feeling didn't get me it. Faith says, faith says the, it's the, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, what is evidence? Let me show you what evidence is. Of course, you, you've all watched uh, uh, court cases where they bring in the evidence, right? And proof. Proof. Evidence. Facts. Facts, right? Sometimes they use the DNA in the, in the, as evidence. I was trying to use feelings as evidence of faith. As evidence that I had my prayer. And, and that God was going to fulfill it. And I left because I was all riled up emotionally. But it wasn't faith. Now let's say I, now I finally got an interview. Because I'll tell you before... While you're unemployed, while you're looking, before you get the chance to talk, even talk to somebody, you have no hope at all. Ain't nobody going to call you up and say, hey, you know, and, and hire you. You got to have contact. You got to meet a contact somehow, right? right? I mean, it may be, it's possible somebody could call you up from a previous thing you worked for or something. But I'm talking about a long term keeping you employed. So I go to an interview. So I come to church and they say, somebody asks how I'm doing. I said, I'm feeling really good. Feeling really good about this interview that I had. In fact, I feel like I nailed it. Schwartz is strong with this one. Right? So I come, I come back the following week. He said, have you heard about that job? Oh, I didn't get the job. I thought you nailed it. Well, that's the way I felt. But then after a long time, I got an opportunity for an interview, went to do the interview, felt like this, you know, mediocre about it. It could have went well, but I'm not sure. Let's say I come to church and somebody asks me about that. Do you have the job? I hope so. Why? Because I have no evidence. Right? But suddenly, not suddenly, but a week later or something, the HR calls my house and says, we want to offer you a job. Do you want to, because I had an interview, right? We want to offer you a job. Of course, as soon as you get that, now you're thinking, oh, well, I don't want to settle for this much. You know, but you'll take it because <laughs> you haven't been working, right? You'll take whatever they give you. But you don't want them to know that, right? But anyway, now when I come to church, somebody says, do you have a job? I have a job. Well, do you have any evidence well, I have someone's word. I had a spokesman who spoke for the company that said, I have a job. And they said, next week I will get a letter of confirmation in the mail. Right? Now, I'm still at this time, I've accepted the job, but the devil's saying, something's going to go wrong, something's going to go wrong, something's going to go wrong, right? He's whispering in you to doubt what could go wrong? I don't know, but something's going to go wrong. They're going to find out something about me. They're going to look on Facebook and see, say, we're not going to hire this guy. Look at that picture he's got on there. You know, that happens, right? <laughs> so then it, I get in the mail, I get this letter. And the letter says, this is the position. This is the date you start. 
This is how much you'll get paid. This is the place you'll meet, you'll report at such and such a time, usually like a Monday morning, right? And then this is the person you're supposed to meet, report to. All the rest of the details are not in that letter. They'll take care of it when you get there, right? So then I come to church that week, and someone says, do you have a job? And I'm like, praise the Lord, I got this evidence in my hand, right? I got the evidence in my hand. We well, see here, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What are we hoping? We're hoping for the word, the promises that God made, the covenant God made to us. We're hoping that there will be, uh, that it'll come to pass. And what is the evidence? Because those things are not seen yet, right? When God makes promise, you don't have it yet. I mean, God, God promised me he would meet all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, and yet I'm unemployed. But now I got the evidence, right? This is like your letter from HR. You not only have a promise, but before I just had a promise, a girl told me I had a job if I wanted it. All I had to do was receive it, right? Well, I already asked for it when I went to interview. Now, all I have to do is receive it, and it's mine. She, they offered it to me. That's what God did. He offered salvation to you, to me. All we have to do is take it. But this is the evidence. This written word of his is the evidence. Faith is a substance of things over the evidence of things not seen. When we see in the word what God has promised, the fact that he cannot lie. God cannot lie. He never has lied. He didn't lie the 33 years he walked on the earth. Do you think he's going to start now? If God said something and he does not uphold his word, that would be a lie. Wouldn't it? I said, Victor, you could use my truck. And then you, and then the next day you say, I'm ready to use that truck. I say, that's my truck. He said, but you said I could use the truck. I lied. Never intended, right? I never intended on letting you use. Who knows why I said it? But God's not like that. What I'm trying to say is God meant everything he said. He said he's going to do it. He meant everything he said, right? Every word. That's the evidence. When you, see, if you, when you have true faith and you are born again, you can understand these things by that spirit, man, and the fact that you have faith. When you can get to that point, you know that because you have the faith, the faith is the substance Right? To bring to pass the word in your life. All you need, if you're going to rely on faith, all you need is to read this or even hear it. Faith is the substance of things over, the evidence of things not seen. I have faith. Therefore, it's got to come to pass, right? Gotcha. But some people say, well, I don't feel it. Have you ever uh, talked to somebody who accepted the Lord and then the next time you see them, you ask them how it's going and they're like, oh, I don't know if I really got it. I just don't feel any different. Feel? Feel. Well, feel is not faith. My son went uh, to a crusade with me downtown Chicago. And I was so glad because I was shocked. At the end, they said, anyone who wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, come down. My son got up. I mean, I was ready to leave, you know, get out of there, you know, because we're at this great big place downtown that it's going to be a lot of traffic trying to get out. I was ready to leave. And here he stands up and he goes down there. And I'm watching him like, oh, no. 
<laughs> not, yeah, now, now it's going to take me forever to get out of here, right? So he gets there, and they, they took him in a little room. And they told him about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then he spoke in tongues. They prayed, you know, they prayed, and, and a lot of people, a lot of people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they spoke in tongues. He never even, nobody taught him how to speak in tongues. He never even heard it. But then I asked him the next week. I said, so have you been praying in tongues? He said, no, I don't think I got it. I, I, I thought you said that you spoke in tongues that night. He said, but I think I made it up. I made it up. And you know, to this day, he does. He believes he made those words up, and he doesn't even believe, believe in it. He doesn't ask for it. He believes in Jesus, but he doesn't really believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Or understand it. Or understand, and that's the key. Understand. By faith, we understand. If you don't have faith, how are you going to understand? And how do you get the faith? Faith cometh by. Hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? People tell me, they say, well, I, you know, I don't have faith. Read the word. And if you, if you have something that's very serious, like when I, had, uh, when I had that tumor, you better bet that I was reading all kinds of promises and believing them. That's scary. When you go through stuff, you don't know if you're going to live or die. That's a scary place to be, and nobody should have to go through that, but people do. God didn't tell you when you got saved you wouldn't have any troubles, right? So let's, let's go through this whole thing. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Did you know, it says the elders, who's the elders, do you think? By it, the elders obtained a good report. Who do you think he's talking about? Now, this is written to the Hebrews. Who's the elders? Priests. Priests. Priests would be in there, part of the elders, yeah. Elders are elders, though, I mean, in the community. But these guys obtained a good report. <clears throat> Jesus gave most of those guys a bad report, right? Those Sadducees and, and uh, Pharisees, he gave them a bad report. Well, you'll notice in the rest of this chapter, verse 4 talks about Abel. Verse 5 talks about Enoch. Verse 7 talks about Noah. Uh, Verse 8 talks about Abraham. And uh, 9 is Isaac and Jacob, right? So we know in context what he's saying here, the elders, he just listed a whole bunch of them. These are the elders, and by faith, the elders obtained a good report because of their faith. Nobody was ever saved without faith. Was it last week or the week before about the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin? They can't do it. Only the blood of Christ, right? So that means that Anytime somebody made an offering, trespass offering, a sin offering, they took the Passover, all the way down through the history. Every time they did that, the Day of Atonement, the only real forgiveness is going to come, it wasn't going to come until Jesus hung on the cross. It was all looking towards that, right? So they had to have faith in God's plan, in God's word. They believed what he told them. Now, verse 3. Through faith. You know, when I see through, through faith, I think of, uh, you, you ever see, uh, and I don't know what you call them. I've seen a lot of these when I was younger. Like you go under the, the uh, road or under something, you, there's a, like a tunnel. It's, it's a metal and you might find it in a creek or something, and they, they have it to move the water from one end to the other. I don't know what you call that. But big, it's big, and a little kid can, can go in there. Now, I might get stuck, I don't know. But I think it's, I think it's a, a 
three feet around or something. Like a, like, a like a like yeah, a storm. Maybe it's storm sewer. Yeah. Well, when it says through faith, I think of this kid walking from the beginning to the end of that thing, going through that. Right? He's walking through that to get to the other side. So through faith, there must be some type of vehicle. Faith is the vehicle that gets us. To where we need to be. You can't. And, and the thing is. You can't get to where you need to be. Without faith. And you can't get faith. By working for it. And you don't get faith. Because you prayed and you felt it. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That's the only way. The Bible ever says faith comes. By hearing the words. And you hear it and you believe it. But through the faith. We understand. This answers the question, how come 7 billion people in the world and so few that actually believe the Word of God? They don't believe it because they can't understand it. They can't understand it because you can only... It's through faith. You can't pass over from ignorance to understanding unless you go through the channel... The sewer pipe of faith. Right? Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And I I, I also picked up on this here. The word worlds is plural. There's not... God just didn't make this planet... There's worlds, different worlds out there. Think about this. And if we talk a little bit about this, I think our last series we went through. There's a, there's a world of hell. Some people are going to that world. There was a, he, uh, a, a, a world called paradise. Right? It was different from this world. When people died, they had to be taken somewhere. And we talked about Lazarus and Abraham, and, and uh, the rich man was in hell, and, and th- those two were in, um, in paradise, right? That's a different world. What about where the angels dwell? Heaven. That's a world. I don't know if all the, there's, a, there's an infinite, it seems like an infinite amount of planets out there. Maybe angels live on those planets. And each one of those is a world that God made. We don't know. Our our understanding is limited. But through faith we can understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. And this framing brings to to a conscious here, a thought about if you're going to build a house, you're going to start with the blueprint and you're going to have a frame. First, you'd have a foundation, right? You have, then you've got to frame it up. If you're going to remodel your, your basement, don't you frame it before you put the drywall on? You have to have a frame, right? Well, everything God created was framed by the Word of God. And the word here is, here is rhema, and it means a spoken word of God. It didn't mean that he took this book and made and framed the world. He spoke. And God said. And God said. Right? And God said. And where do we see that so much? We see it a lot in the New Testament. Jesus said, whatsoever you saith, that's what you, you will have. You got to be careful what you say with your mouth. He said, whatever you say, that's what you're going to get. You pray for healing, and then somebody says, well, you know, how do you feel now? Oh, man, I got so much pain. Well, you just, you prayed for healing. So now you're saying, I have all this pain. Maybe be better not to say anything. Say, you know what, I feel better. And that's what you're confessing anyway. You want to get better, right? I feel better. You're not lying, right? 
but I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk negative about yourself. You got enough people in the world that are talking negative about you, right? You don't need to talk negative about yourself. But through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. Why don't the atheists understand this? Because it's by faith, through faith. They don't have the faith, so therefore they cannot understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. How many of you have heard about the Big Bang? See, the scientists say in the beginning there was this condensed matter of some sort. And there was this gigantic explosion. And the universe came into existence. God's word said in the beginning there was nothing. Even if he used the Big Bang, he had to make the matter first. Right? Even if, if he used the Big Bang, he had to do that first. Well, why can't they understand? Because it's through faith. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. There's a, uh, an interesting thing in uh, Genesis. I'm I'm thinking about um, uh, creation. I said, and God said, and God said, and God said. And you know how many times he said whatever he was saying? How many times? He says, God said, God said. It was ten times. And we happen to know, like the Ten Commandments, it's a, it's a, it represents complete, like a divine order. Not divine order, but order. Right? And completeness. Like there's Ten Commandments. There wasn't Eleven Commandments. There wasn't Nine Commandments. There wasn't Fifteen, like that movie, and Moses dropped one, or one tablet. That, that wasn't the way it was. It's Ten, and it has to be Ten, just like God made you have Ten, ten Fingers. Ten toes. That that's, uh, shows your, the order and your completeness, right? In the 12th, 12th or 13th century, there was this rabbi that was reading the book of Genesis. Now, he's not a Christian. He was, he was reading the Hebrew Genesis. They, have the, they had the, the uh, first 39 books, right? They didn't have the New Testament. But he was reading it. And he came across us, and God said, and God said, and he added them up. And he, and he wrote this essay or thesis about, he believed every time it said, God said, God made another dimension. And he based that on, because when God spoke forth the word, the universe came into existence, right? So if he spoke again, doesn't his words always come to pass? So he spoke this, he spoke that, and he, so he got this idea that he made ten, ten dimensions or ten different worlds. What's interesting is this was like in the 12th, he didn't have any, um, any knowledge of science. He wasn't a scientist. He had no knowledge about it. He's talking about dimension in the 12th century. And it wasn't until a few years ago that the quantum physicists, or or plural, physicists, agreed that based on science and math and all their calculations, there's 10 dimensions. How did this guy know in 1200 or 1300 or whenever it was. How did he know? Just by reading the chapter, the first chapter of Genesis, he got the, the revelation that God, when he created, he made, the, when he created the universe, he made 10 different dimensions. And now the scientists today say that there's 10 different dimensions. And then they also say this, because he also, and I believe he also said this, said, oh, yeah, he did. He said, there's ten dimensions, but only four of them can be uh, observed or, or uh, influence man. Four. Four. 
Now, this, these quantum physicists, they say there's 10 dimensions, but only four really apply to us. Is that weird? Very. And then they say that there's um, uh, height, height, length, and depth, right? And that's three dimensions. We, we all usually say we live in a three-dimensional world, right? But then Einstein came along and he said, wait a minute. There's something you're leaving out of the equation, and that was time. Right? So he, the fourth dimension is time. It's interesting, when Paul wrote his letter of the Ephesians, he talked about four dimensions. He said length, height, width, and breadth. And the word breadth could literally mean uh, some expansion or some dimension that's in the rest of the other three. And I'm not exactly sure how, you know, how it all comes out scientifically. But I think that's interesting that all the way back then, this guy believed he saw it in Genesis. I believe there's lots of things locked in Genesis. The Bible, code? the Bible codes are throughout. Did you know, by the way, that um, uh, David, King David, his genealogy, you know, his lineage, is in the Bible codes in uh, the 38th chapter of Genesis, I think it is. In the Bible codes, it has his, his genealogy. Hidden, but it's there. Why would God put something hidden in the Word which we can't even see? In fact, God knew that we wouldn't even be able to see it until we got to this place in time where we could use a computer. A computer runs through the, runs through the, the words and calculates. And, and when you, you start, the, you say, okay, in the beginning, uh, let's just let's look at every fifth letter. Oh, I didn't find anything. Let's look at every sixth letter. Right? And then you, you, you find in, the, in the, uh, every seventh letter, it says there's uh, four there letters, H-O-L-Y. But there's seven letters between them that are six between them that don't count, right? They call it the equidistant letter system. And what they find is, and I'm just using this as an example, they find holy, holy, holy. And you know that's not there by coincidence. There's so many, so many of these Bible codes, you know it's not there by coincidence. There's things we talked about here. I don't know if you remember when we looked at the, the meaning of the names when we looked in Genesis. The, name, the meaning of the names and it, 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 before the flood. And it told a prophecy, a magnificent prophecy about Noah. About actually about Christ who would come. Verse 4. By faith, so he's defined faith, right? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Are you all familiar with the story of Cain and Abel? And what, what is this referring to? By it he being dead yet speaketh. Remember, after he was killed, he was speaking to God. He was calling out to God, probably for vengeance. God said, the, the, I can hear the voice of your, bro, your brother's blood. Let's go look at that in Genesis. The story of Abel, Cain and Abel. Chapter 4, verse 1, Genesis and Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now, when it says he knew her, it means he had sexual intercourse with her. It didn't mean like, hey, I'm Adam, 
Oh, I'm Eve. And they just met, and now he knew her. <laughs> when Adam and Eve had sex, and she conceived, and the fact that the word says she conceived shows you, and you, you're going to see it, she, they, she has children, you're going to show you what new meant. When Adam knew his wife, Eve, she conceived and bare Cain, so Cain's the oldest, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she was excited. Because, do you remember, when before she was cast out of the garden, God read her the riot act. And he said, but, you will have a child. Or a child will be born of your seed, will crush the head of the enemy. She thought, most likely she thought Cain was the one. It's her first child. She bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. So Abel was younger. We don't know how much. It, it, could, have, uh, it could have been uh, within a year or something. It could, they could have even been twins and one was born first. But I don't think so. I think there was some time between it. And uh, she again bare... Well, in fact, we, we know that Abel and... Uh, well, no, we really don't know Abel and Cain, uh, whether they were twins or not. Suffice it to say that Cain was the older one. She again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. What what would you classify that title? What, what was his... Sheep herder. Ju- sheep herder. That's good. Sheep herder. What's, what is Cain? What's his job title? Farmer. He's a farmer. Right. right? Now, is there anything wrong with being a farmer? No. no. In fact, thank God we have farmers who we wouldn't be getting that food from the jewel. <laughs> right? From the food store. Or probably from Walmart, the way we are. But <laughs> it's all we can afford here. But anyway. So in the process of time, Cain brought... Oh, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was a, was a sheep holder, a keeper of the sheep. And there was nothing wrong with either of those jobs. In the process of time, it came to pass, verse 3, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering... Unto the Lord. Was there anything wrong with bringing an offering of the fruit of the ground? When in Leviticus it talks about the offerings, you had the sin offering and the burnt offering and the, the uh, trespass offering. Well, there were offering that was just food, a meal, meal, a meal offering. So there's nothing wrong with it. Except for God said or revealed to in Leviticus that you don't offer a meal offering without first offering the burnt offering. Okay? The burnt offering had to come first. Well, it doesn't say anything about him offering a burnt offering. It just says he brought the meal. Now, Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very angry, very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, it says Abel, in verse 4, Abel brought of the... also brought of the firstlings. It talks about Cain, he brought... He brought the sacrifice of the meal, the food. What does also mean? When you, you, in English, when you say also, what does it mean? Like, I did this and I also did that. I bought this and I also bought that, right? So if you have also, that means plus. plus. So when I read this, I'm, I, what I'm seeing here is that Cain brought a meal offering, but Abel also brought of the firstling of his flock. Hmm. 
that would mean, it doesn't say it, but it, that would mean that Abel offered two offerings. He offered the, the, the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof, that's a burnt offering. And the word also leads us to think that maybe, or probably, he also brought a fruit of the ground offering. Now, going back to Hebrews, and don't lose your place there in Genesis. But back at Hebrews 11, in verse 4, it said, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his what? God testifying of his gifts. The word gifts... Is that singular or plural? Plural. That means he brought more than one. Doesn't it? He brought more than one gift. Or it would have said, God testified of his gift. Singular. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. Now, faith... He said, by faith, Abel offered unto God. What we've learned is in order to have faith, because faith is the substance of what's hoped for, right? So you have to have what's hoped for before faith is the substance. And we said that what you hope for is the promises or the word of God. That you do this and God will do this, right? Somewhere, he mu- Abel and Cain must have been taught the right way to offer these offerings. No they had to, because it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And I believe what, what the more excellent sacrifice was, he did it the right way. He offered the burnt offering before he offered... The meal, because what the meal offering means is, I have peace with God. What the burnt offering means is, this animal was slain for me. And before you can have a relationship with God, you must have the Lamb of God. Right? That's what makes every religion in the world false, except for Christianity. It doesn't matter all the works. It doesn't matter as we talk about the feelings that you have. What matters is did you do it the way God said to do it? And so Cain is the first one that we know of who decided to to do his worship the way he wanted to do it. Now this wasn't the first, this offering uh, here of uh, Abel in verse 4 Chapter 4, verse 4 in Genesis. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. This wasn't the first sacrificial offering. There was another one recorded in the scripture. Remember when Adam and Eve, they had the fig leaves to, to, to cover their shame, their nakedness. What did God do? He gave him clothes, and did did he go up to coals? No, he sacrificed. He sacrificed, right? The blood flowed, and the skins became their their covering, right? And what does that say? In that the 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 Lamb of God will give His life, so we would have a covering of His righteousness, right? Well, Adam and Eve were taught this. And Adam was alive for about 900 years. So any time, I mean, they just had these kids. I'm sure they raised these kids and they showed him, they showed both those kids how to offer the sacrifices. And then when Abel offered it, he did it the way God taught him. And Cain refused to do it that way. Probably because he had to go to his brother and get the lamb because he wasn't the shepherd and he had an attitude problem he said I ain't going to go to my I don't need my brother I'm just as good as him 
He really didn't have an option of it. I mean, he'd have to go get one. His brother, they were his, so he'd choose the best one out of the bunch for offering. And then Cain came along, and I mean, what's he going to get? He's never going to get the best one to offer. So what has he got? Nothing. No, but he could have taken the second best, and that would have been his best. What? It, there must have been some... I mean, he, yeah. there, we don't have the whole story. He might have went to his brother and said... I need a, I need to offer up a, a, a burnt offering, and his brother said, "Well, you know, I'm the only store in town." <laughs> right? Yeah. What did they do? When did what did they do when uh, they have a in Houston when they had the crisis? Yeah. What happened to the gas? The price of gas? Nuts. Ten dollars for yeah. bottles of water. It, it, it's crazy because they called gouging. Right? You you see that uh, happen all the time. You get. Uh, you have some calamity happen. If you had a calamity out here, how much do you think a bottle of water would cost? If water was in short supply? Drinking water. Three or four bucks, probably. You know? $10. And they, they tell me, you know, I've heard this before. Don't put any of that dye, that blue dye in there, your toilet, because you may need to drink that water. And that sounds disgusting to me. <laughs> That's third world countries. So. <laughs> but I guess you could, with any luck, you could boil it. But I'll tell you what, if you're, if you're dying, you drink the toilet water. Just the way the dog did, right? He doesn't have any problem with it. <laughs> but there's just some thought about that. But anyway, so Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock... He also brought up the phone. And the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you doest well, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? In other words, if you do it the right way, won't I accept your gift? Just like I accepted your brother? And if you do not doest well, in other words, if you refuse to do it my way, sin lieth at the door. In the word here, lieth, it's, it's more like if you had... Uh, do you ever see how a, a, you got a lion and he's, he's like hiding, waiting to strike in the jungle to, you know, the zebra, trying to catch a zebra or something? And he's crouching. Then he lunges out, right? That's what the Hebrew says here. He said, sin like a crouching animal... Lie is lying at, or is at your door, and unto thee shall be his desire. In other words, if you don't do things God's way, sin will continue to be crouching after you, to be hunting you down. It will be his desire. His desire. I think that's a reference to the demon behind it. Because all sin is inspired by demonic forces. Why do we sin? Why why do we sin after we're saved? Somehow we're tempted and we we fall, right? right? Unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Oh, let me me say this. uh, uh, When it says, and thou shalt rule over him. If this is referring to... The satanic agency, sin shall uh, crouches at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, the demonic spirit. But then it says, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, if you will do well, you would rule over that, right? And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. 
And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? There's no fear of God here. He wouldn't do it. God just spoke to him. He told him, Why didn't you do it the right way? Why are you angry? Why are you playing the fool? Right? Yeah. I told, I showed you how to do it. Your brother showed you how to do it. And yet you refused to do it my way. And then you, I ask you, where's your brother? He said, I don't know. Of course he knew where he was. He knew exactly where he killed him. It says he killed his brother. He knew exactly where he was. And he said, what have you done? God says, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, remember he was a tiller of the ground, now in the future when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her, or thee her strength. In other words, your farming career is over, buddy. Mm-hmm. What's he going to do? God says, you'll be a fugitive and a vagabond, shalt thou be in the earth. And you know what Cain does then? Look in verse 17. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city. And he called the name of the city after his, the name of his son Enoch. He built the city. Why did, I think the reason he built the city is because he couldn't make a living. Everybody was probably afraid of him. Watch out. Cain killed his brother. Stay away from that madman, right? Now he builds a city. The guy who builds the city is probably the one that's ruler over it. But he can't do anything else. He, it looks like he just gets evil, more and more evil, right? Okay, let's jump back to Hebrews and finish this out. Hebrews chapter 11 I'm going to start at verse 1 and and read all the way through verse 4. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders, including Abel, obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand. See, we, we understand the thing about Abel's life because through faith, we can understand. And through faith we understand other things, like the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The invisible comes into the visible. God speaks it into, into, into uh, this three-dimensional earth that we, or, or world that we know. And here's the uh, verse 4. This is uh, kind of summarizes and, uh, uh, what we looked at with Abel. And Cain, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. I submit that Abel had to have had foreknowledge like we talked about. He had to know what was the right way to do it. He had to know how does God want me to do this or he couldn't have done it by faith. Because we couldn't have faith without having the word of God. Faith cometh by faith. Hearing and hearing the word of God, right? So Abel had to have knowledge of what God said. And if Abel had knowledge of what God said, didn't Cain have that knowledge also? And Abel chose to do it the right way, and Cain chose to do it the wrong way. And so... By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And now we can see what that means here. By it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Remember, God said that I hear Abel's blood crying from the ground. Did you know the the Bible says that 
the um, life of the animal or the human being is in the blood. Life is in the blood. And they, they, uh, he set up a whole, a whole uh, way of, uh, of kosher killing in, when, he, when he gave the law. He didn't want the animals to struggle. He wanted it to all... He cut, cut the throat so that the pain and the death would be... The death would be short. The pain would be quick and they're dead. All the blood comes out. Because God is merciful. We don't really pay so much attention to that anymore. And you, you got in our society. I, I, I had a, a guy, a, a friend of mine, who uh, he in, he lived in Florida. He raised uh, chickens for Tyson, and he had three chicken coops, and he had between five and ten thousand chickens in there. And I walked through that thing with him, and it was terrible. All these feathers, and, you know, you're afraid like you're going to get uh, some lung, lung disease or something. Right? I don't know what's going to happen, but it feels like I can't breathe in here. He would go through, and he would pick up the runts and break their necks. And I was like, this, this kind of grossed me out, you know? It's like, you murderer. And he, then he explained to me. He said, he said, Tyson will pay you by the pounds. You get paid by the pounds of the chicken when they come and get them. And you, they also deduct the cost of the feed. He said, if I leave those runts alive, they'll eat all the seed. And they won't add any weight. And I'll get cheated. I don't believe that's the way God wants us to do it, to, to kill animals on a, uh, for no reason. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just, I'm just saying we do, we don't do it because we, we buy chickens at the store. You know, some, some people, I'm, I'm sure there's some people in this country that go to the store, they don't even know when you buy a ham that it came from a pig. Or you buy a steak and it came from a cow. They don't even know. Which was humanely killed. Which was humanely killed with a bolt in his head. <laughs> Did you ever see this one where uh, in Africa they would catch a live monkey and they put him in a table. There's a hole in the table. It goes around his neck and then they crack his skull and they eat his brains. Cook him first. Well, no, yes. he's alive. He's, he's alive. alive. He's, he's <laughs> and you're eating his brain. Because you know it's right here, and, it, and this top of his head is there, and they they eat his brain out of his head. They pop it open while he's alive, screaming. That can't be of God. <laughs> That's demonic. That's demonic, and in my opinion. So we've covered four verses in chapter eleven. So obviously. Um, Next week, we'll start with Enoch, verse 5. Chapter 11, verse 5. What? And monkey brains. And no monkey brains. You raise enough chickens, it's a big, big money-making. Oh, yeah. In Jamaica. um, Here, too? There's there's this big uh, company called uh, Grace. uh, They have uh, Grace Chicken, our our best-dressed chicken. Yeah, they're literally, you have to have like, uh, I would say about two or three, I would say about two million Jamaican dollars. Uh, roughly maybe 200,000 to start up. So you have, to, you have to come up with that to start up. But they, they, wow. the company will come out and build this chicken coop, and it's huge, it's long, it's air conditioned. Right, that's what he had. He had it's three of those. It's all air conditioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to. So, you, you, you supply the land. They build the uh, they build the, the, the chicken coop. You supply the water. They supply the feed. And um, and you go out there and break their necks. No, actually, way they do it though. They said, okay, um, there's like there's like say uh, 
you know, like 5,000 chickens need to be killed, they send their own people to come in and uh, slaughter the Oh, they do. Yeah. Okay. What exactly do you think they're supplying the feed? What are they putting in that feed? No. Well, I hope they're not putting putting anything gross in there. They're really, I mean, in Jamaica, they really don't use, um, oh, there, yeah.